Hello and welcome. We're pleased to have you join us for today's webinar, CPI 260 Forum, Reviewing Some Basics and Your Questions Answered. This webinar is sponsored by CPP, the exclusive publisher of several powerful assessments, including the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator and the CPI 260. My name is Laura Simons, Product Marketing Manager here at CPP, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. But before we begin, I'd like to cover just a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar will run approximately one hour with the last 10 to 15 minutes reserved for your question and answer. If you do have a question, please submit it via the questions box located on the right side of your screen. You can submit your questions anytime throughout the presentation and we will address as many as possible. This webinar is being recorded and we'll send out a link to the recording and a copy of the presentation slides afterwards. So for those of you who went through a certification workshop, today's webinar is a refresher of what you learned. For others, it's a review to brush up on facts about the assessment and some interpretation techniques. This is actually the first of a two-part CPI 260 refresher series and today focuses on the client feedback report. The second forum will be on October 16th and will focus on the coaching report for leaders. Today and in October, our speaker is Robert Devine. Rob Devine is a senior management consultant and author of the CPI 260 certification booklet and other books. And he's also the CPI 260 certification trainer. Rob, welcome. And I'd like to turn the presentation over to you. Oh, thanks very much, Laura. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and to reconnect with so many of you, even though we're doing this online and it's, and it's kind of virtual. But the good news is it allows me to do this presentation to you wearing shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> Put that picture in your mind. Uh, you can see the uh, agenda that we've got up for today. As Laura mentioned, we'll run for about 45 minutes to an hour to just kind of cover hopefully some familiar ground for you. I think the participants in today's webinar will uh, see several slides from our CPI 260 certification programs and hopefully they'll be familiar to you and useful. I thought we'd start out with some, uh, some purposes uh, around, the, uh, around the CPI, um, talk to that, uh, that wonderful word describing you uh, that we use so frequently during our certification programs. Uh, also wanted to give you just a brief overview of the 29 scales on the CPI and, and, and basically just kind of walk you through a client feedback report. Uh, we've got a, uh, a CPI 260 protocol that we'll use for a person named John uh, and uh, we'll run through John's CPI 260 results and I will apply the steps to conducting a CPI interpretation and we will come up with a list of strengths, of style, and a couple of developmental opportunities for John. So in a way, you'll be able to kind of look over my shoulder as I, as I do this, and hopefully that will act as a refresher for you as to things that you learned during the program. Um, I wanted to then f finish things up with some frequently asked questions. Uh, we've had some sent in. We pick them up all the time uh, in, the, in the certification programs, as well as customers just calling in to CPP, and I wanted to run th through two or three of the uh, most uh, frequent ones and, and propose an answer. And if you've got things that come up for you during the, uh, during the webinar, as Laura mentioned, please email them into her. Uh, so let's go on. Uh, let's switch to this first slide now. Uh, you can kind of see, this one should look familiar to, uh, to attendees at the certification programs. This comes directly from that uh, presentation. The CPI 260, empirically derived instrument. The scales are empirically derived, meaning that the descriptions that come from being high on a scale or low on a scale actually come from someplace. 
you hopefully remember all all that. The second bullet uh, was one of the test items <laughs> from the certification program. The purpose of the CPI is to describe you as if you were being described by a group of knowledgeable and objective others. Uh, so uh, that's a big deal. Uh, I often say to my clients, hey, you know what, my job is to describe you back to you and maybe even the organization in terms of your strength and style and against that context of strength and style, I'd like to propose any developmental opportunities that might be apparent. And given that the CPI's purpose is to describe you, it's a big part of the battery of assessments that I want to use to, to achieve those objectives. Uh, the third bullet, uh, again, indicates the CPI concerns itself with normal characteristics. I think we mentioned that because sometimes clients get the sense just from those very unusual CPI items that don't seem to have anything to do with anything that, gee, maybe this is a clinical assessment when, in fact, uh, as we know, it is based on normal populations it, uh, and it tries to describe people around characteristics that everybody recognizes and that are useful for them. Uh, we often talk about the CPI as being incremental in the sense that we like to use it with other assessments. If you can combine the CPI 260 with, say, for example, uh, a, 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 an MBTI, MBTI Step 1 or Step 2, especially in a developmental situation, of course, not a selection situation. But if you can combine it with other assessments, the point is that it really adds to, uh, adds to the description about strength and style. Um, we often say that the CPI is descriptive. We also say it's comparative. It's one of those assessments that has norms associated with it, and you can compare people's scores to those norms, thinking about those norms as sort of the expected scores for managers and executives, and then make some proposals about strengths, style, and developmental opportunities or blind spots. Um, relative to the similarity to those norms and the differences to those norms. And then, as we mentioned, uh, there are 29 scales on the CPI, and we'll look at them all uh, this morning, but briefly. And speaking of 29 scales, how do you keep track of all of that? Well, if you look on this next uh, slide, you'll see our three-phase approach. You remember our discussions about this, I hope, in the uh, certification programs. It's uh, those 29 scales, plus if you're using other assessments, that's a lot of stuff to keep track of. And I just love this simple model for, for helping me keep track. It's memorable. Uh, my clients and my executives and manager, they, uh, they remember this. <laughs> they know what it means. Uh, I like it because it's sequential. Uh, it kind of, uh, you know, we run through these phases of, well, what? data do we have about you? Your dominant score is 76, your Myers-Briggs type is this, and uh, we start to collect all of the data and get a sense of uh, this individual, how they've scored on all of these various assessments and all these various scales, and then move into that second phase of, well, so what are the implications of that, if it's true? And it's at that second phase that we would look at these characteristics that we're collecting and start to characterize them as to whether they are helping us or hindering us achieve our objectives. And then the now what phase is the most important of the three, in my opinion. It uh, is the reason we got together, is to come up with an individual development plan, uh, with a set of steps, perhaps, for being even more effective. Here's one thing. If you could attend to this, it could make you even more effective as a, as a contributor and as a, as a brand. And not a laundry list of six or seven things, but one or two key things. I like this uh, model. I got it from the folks at Center for Creative Leadership. It uh, was one of the folks at CCL described this three phases to me as, in some ways, being a very, very uh, big scale summary of their leadership development programs. Uh, I also like this because of, of that third phase. It, it helps me remember that's why we're getting together and that the assessments that I am using are merely devices for coming up with that description of strengths, style, and those possible blind spots. So hopefully you remember those three phases, and I'll mention it once or twice. I can't help it <laughs> as we go through looking at all of this data. So let's see. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, you can kind of see uh, that uh, we mentioned there are 29 CPI scales. We always start with the big picture scales first. There's three of them. Uh, 
on the CPI. The first one is indicated by the horizontal continuum on that illustration you can see in front of you. Uh, all of us fall on that horizontal continuum somewhere. Those who fall towards the left pole of that horizontal line move towards people. They are described by others as involved and participative and active. They're joiners, basically. Um, they're externally oriented in CPI language. Those who fall towards the right pole of that horizontal continuum tend to pull back from people and are therefore described as maybe uh, subdued and detached, and quiet and private and so on. Uh, you'll likely recognize it and remember it as a sort of an extroversion introversion scale. Uh, the CPI refers to it as externality or internality. Uh, and again, all of us uh, fall on that continuum somewhere. It's a major theme on the CPI about how we present ourselves to others, moving towards them or pulling back from them. The second major theme on the CPI is represented by that vertical continuum. Hopefully this is all familiar to you, of being rule favoring versus rule questioning. Again, they're not my rules, but you know what? I could get behind these, so say the higher scores on this vertical continuum, or they might take an approach to, gee, what's with the rules? Man, these are like handcuffs. These are holding us back. You're doing this, why? Because they're the rules, that's why we're doing it? That doesn't make sense. So would say the lower, the scores, the folks who score a little lower on that vertical continuum. Again, it's a major theme of the on the CPI, uh, people who score towards the upper end of that uh, continuum. Uh, as you can see, it says supports customs and cooperative and steadfast and conforming versus folks who kind of challenge the convention and maybe a little bit innovative. But they push the envelope for those lower scores. When you set those uh, two scales up this way, it gives rise to these four lifestyles. Each one is a combination of the two scales or two themes. Uh, implementers combine moving towards people and being rule favoring. They're the folks in the upper left-hand quadrant. Uh, the innovators move towards people also, but they question the rules, so hence the name innovator and so on. Supporters in the upper right-hand quadrant are quieter, behind-the-scenes folks who follow the, uh, the rules and regulations of the culture and of the corporation, of the company perhaps. And folks in the lower right-hand quadrant combine that rule questioning with that focus on the inner life, the so-called visualizers. We often, as you may recall from our, our certification programs, we often saw lots of mathematicians, artists, uh, architects, for example, as subject matter experts. A lot of individual contributors show up in that vis visualizer uh, quadrant. So the, you may remember these four lifestyles. Each one of them comes also packed with a satisfaction level, and you'll see it on the next scale, uh, slide. Uh, the, uh, it's a scale that runs from one through seven. If we can change that slide to the level of satisfaction scale. There it is, thank you. Uh, and uh, you can see it's a scale that runs from one through seven. Um, if you score towards the higher end of this scale, towards the uh, six and seven, people describe such folks as confident, competent, self-controlled, and so on. They're fairly uh, positive. They're kind of resilient. You may remember our, our description of some of those higher scores on the satisfaction scale. Even when life throws them a curve, what is it? If life gives them lemons, they make lemonade kind of uh, worldview. Folks who score towards the lower end on this continuum, levels one and two, tend to be described by others as dissatisfied and unfulfilled, unsure, kind of, uh, it's, it's as if their worldview is, gee, I don't quite have this together yet, I'm still working on that, but there are parts of my life that I'm not comfortable with and that are frustrating to me. Uh, you remember the scale um, in our certification program, we put like a, a dotted line above the scale, it looks kind of like a normal bell curve, if you will, with the high point above four, and we said that most people in the general population, folks in general score between level three and five, and you see fewer and fewer people at sixes and sevens and ones and twos. Many of our managers and executives, in our experience, generally score levels four to five and higher. So if you put all those three big picture scales together, let me take us back to a previous slide. 
So you can kind of see there are the four lifestyles. You can see the list of descriptors for each of the four lifestyles, a favorable list and an unfavorable list. And another way to sort of describe that level of satisfaction scale is to say that we find that folks who score higher on that scale are generally described by others in ways similar to the adjectives in the favorable lists for each of the lifestyles. And as that satisfaction score comes down, say at levels three through five, you see a mix of favorable and not so favorable things. And for folks who score at levels one and two, we often see uh, some of those unfavorable adjectives showing up in the descriptions earlier because that's what people see. So, so hopefully this is all familiar to you. But it's a, uh, it's a big step in the CPI. We want to get a sense of, uh, uh, of what's the lifestyle for a client and at what level. Uh, for that client. Uh, again, uh, that satisfaction scale tries to ascertain the degree to which a person takes their lifestyle to its positive potential. So, so we get a, a sense of uh, lifestyle and level, uh, and then we go on to some of the detail scales. And let's take a look at some of those on the next slide. You can see this, uh, that we've gone through three CPI scales. We have 26 left. <laughs> And here they are divided into these categories. The first category, the dealing with others categories, are interpersonal in nature, all about self-presentation, about ways of relating to others. The self-management scales are more intrapersonal, about personal values and attitudes relative to things such as structure, regulations, the rules, quote-unquote. Uh, little self-management scales. The motivations and thinking style scales, there are three of them, a lot to do with achievement drive, about intellectual focus, and then some personal characteristics such as flexibility and sensitivity and so on. And then we finish things off with a, uh, a set of six work-related measures. These, these are called, we call them the new addition scales, and we call them new because they were scales that were added after the CPI item set had been collected. And from uh, from research, and uh, uh, these scales showed up over the years, and we found that they were very useful scales. And they sh they add another light shining on uh, how people um, complete their days in the world of work. So, so you likely remember these uh, categories of scales, uh, and then uh, let's go on and take a look at them in a little bit of detail on the next slide. There are those interpersonal scales. There's seven of them, starting with DO for dominance running all the way through to EM for empathy. Uh, dominance is such a workhorse scale, you may remember it. It's such an important scale for describing a leadership style. It's about assertiveness and confidence and poise and task focus and so on. Um, it's also, uh, uh, as I say, all of these scales have to do with how we present ourselves to others all the way through to the empathy scale. It's always helpful for us when we're doing a CPI interpretation to take a look at these seven scales and see are they generally high, are they about where expected, are they generally lower. And as I look at the seven scales, which ones are highest, which ones are lowest? Is this a statement the person is making? Are there peaks and valleys on the scores and so forth? Uh, and uh, then we go on to uh, the uh, next uh, self-management scales. Uh, the uh, intrapersonal focus of these scales, as you recall, starting with RE for responsibility and uh, social conformity and self-control, running all the way down to TO for tolerance, and they uh, attempt to describe our need for uh, and approach to things such as structure, rules, policy. Folks who score higher on these scales embrace and accept and promote such things. Folks who score lower on some of these scales tend to push back against such things as structure and the way we do things around here. Uh, and, um, and as I mentioned, it runs all the way through to that TO scale, that tolerance scale. You can see it listed there as openness to others and, and also openness to their ideas. Uh, remember, this is a multivariate assessment, so we mentioned 29 scales. In a way, it's sort of like having your client take 29 assessments. And then the interpretive process for you is basically going into those 29 assessments and unlocking them, coming up with a sense of strength and style and possible blind spots. Now we move on to the motivations and thinking style scales. Uh, there are just three of them. You may remember these achievement scales, AC, achievement and structured, sort of formulaic work environments, and the AI scale being achievement in work environments that require and reward 
innovation and improvisation and uh, so forth uh, in, in that workplace. You may recall the CF scale, perceptual fluency, uh, described somewhat. Uh, it's the one scale in the CPI that, that co-varies uh, strongest with uh, intelligence measures. It's about using one's given talents, I guess, is the way to describe that scale. And then we go on to the uh, personal style scales three of them in that category. You may remember the insightfulness scale, a real interesting scale, uh, a facility with relating to and understanding people, but at the conceptual level, more theoretical level. You may remember a few scales ago, we talked about empathy. It's also about an awareness of others, but more at the sort of uh, emotional level, kind of responsive level. This is a more scientific interest in people, so empathy and insightfulness really powerful together uh, for describing uh, how, how people, uh, how astute are they at uh, evaluating and noticing and attending to people. Flexibility, uh, again, another fascinating scale with a whole literature behind it. Adaptability, curiosity, and need for variety for higher scores versus uh, an element of stubbornness and rigidity, and, but good order for lower scores. And then the sensitivity scale, uh, again, about tough-mindedness, aggressiveness uh, for uh, higher score, uh, for lower scores, pardon me, versus vulnerability, a sort of a gentleness and a tender-mindedness for higher scores. So, so you're kind of getting a sense of all of these scales coming together in, into quite a mix and how useful such uh, topics and characteristics would be for describing people. Uh, we move on to the work-related measures. Uh, there are six of those, as you recall, these are those new Newer scales I mentioned, starting with managerial potential and work orientation and create creative temperament all the way down to law enforcement orientation. And again, uh, helpful scales. They, um, it, as the scales, when you start to look at all 29 of them, you start to see and look for patterns that begin in one part of the protocol and then start to show up, oh my, the empathy score is high. The, uh, tolerance score is high, the good impression score is high, and the amicability, the ami here, is also high. You start to see this pattern of somebody who likes people and is warm and supportive and easy to get along with and cooperative and so forth, or perhaps it's opposite. Uh, and then all the possibilities that happen as these scales, uh, as they vary. So, so there are the 29 scales. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. This is where it uh, starts to get interesting, where we say, well, uh, there are four steps to a uh, conducting an interpretation. We've got them listed here. We spent quite a bit of time in the certification program going through them. Uh, the first one, establishing the validity of the protocol. You may recall that the CPI has some so-called lie scales built into them, into it. Uh, the one that we're focused on is whether our client attempted to over-represent their strengths and downplay their uh, liabilities, uh, the so-called uh, faking good uh, possibility. Uh, and um, so that's always the first step in conducting an interpretation. Then we look at lifestyle and level. Are we looking at here an innovator level four? Oh, it's an innovator level seven. Oh, no, and supporter level six, and so forth. So we kind of get that sense of context in terms of uh, what they bring to their work. And then we go into the, some of the detail steps here steps three and four of normative, ipsative, and a configurable analysis, or in other words, a scale combination look at the, uh, at the uh, results. Remember, we kind of talked about these four steps. It, the, the four steps, as you see them, highlight the iterative nature of doing a CPI interpretation, that is, looking at the data, combing through it, looking for this facet, combing through it, looking for that characteristic, and going it through it over and over and over again until that image, that portrait of strength and style and blind, possible blind spots begins to emerge. And uh, we had uh, practice time, as you recall, set up in the certification program for it. And I think you kind of get a sense of uh, wanting to get several of these CPIs under your belt uh, in order to be able to fine tune your skills at uh, coming up with this description for your client. Uh, so so let's, um, let's go on to um, these four steps, you can kind of see, let's take a look at uh, our um, volunteer, John. He went through a leadership development program uh, just a few months ago. 
uh, that uh, I was involved with, and part of the battery of assessments that we used uh, with John to help describe him was CPI 260. So the first thing that I did when I received his results was to, like step number one says here, you can see it highlighted, was to establish the validity of the protocol. I wanted to know, is John Fate good or not? Uh, and uh, so, so we'll go on to the next slide here, and you'll see on page two of his client feedback report a couple sentences that we look for. Uh, under your approach to the questionnaire, on page two of the report, we look to see is the sentence no indication of anything unusual was found, which suggests it's kind of code for us as the interpreters to know that this person did not take good. In other words, you can more or less trust his results as being fairly uh, accurate and candid on his part. He was into self-revealing as opposed to being into self-presentation. Uh, not so that second sentence showing under the first bullet, your answers put more emphasis on your favorable qualities and so on. This is the sentence that would show up on page two for a person who has tried to overrepresent their strengths and downplay their liabilities. And I won't go into too much uh, discussion about this. Hopefully you all remember it from the certification program and the, uh, the uh, marker scale for faking good, that is the good impression scale, and the, when people tend to overrepresent their strengths, they generally score about 70 or so or higher on that GI scale. We talked about the uh, construction properties of that scale and the interpretive statements that you can make uh, when this uh, occurs for a protocol. So, so that's where we uh, take a look. So let's go on to the next slide and take a look at uh, John's actual client feedback report. Uh, hope you can see this. Uh, you can see it clearly enough for our purposes, I think, today. There's page two of his client feedback report. There's your approach, approach to the instrument section that I mentioned earlier. And there's that sentence for no indication of anything unusual was found for John. So, so I know that I can go forward with my interpretation knowing that the results are likely uh, more or less candid on John's, uh, on John's behalf. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. You'll remember the second step for our CPI 260 interpretation is to take a look at lifestyle and level. And so we go to page four. And I'll take a, show it to you on the next slide here. Uh, page four of John's client feedback report. Uh, you can kind of see there's that lifestyle diagram. Uh, you can see the horizontal continuum for externality, internality, the vertical one for rule favoring versus rule questioning. Uh, and again, you can see for John that one of the uh, quadrants in the illustration is highlighted for implementer. It tells us that's how he came out on these uh, the two scales. That is that he kind of tends to move towards people and that is rule favoring. If you look closely in the sort of towards the middle of the implementer box, but down closer to the horizontal line, you'll see that little diamond that's been superimposed there. That's the actual plot about how John scored on these uh, on these two scales. Uh, but it gives us an idea of uh, his uh, of his type. The next slide is page five of his client feedback report. Uh, this is that third big picture scale, is satisfaction level. Ooh, he scored at level seven. So you can start to think to yourself, wow. So we have an implementer that is somebody who moves towards people, rule favoring, probably seen by most of the people that he works with as operating at his best with that level seven uh, scale score there. Uh, you then, if you need some words to start to remember, what we want to do is to describe John in terms of his strengths, style, possible blind spots, and already I'm starting to get some ideas of strengths. Take a look at the next slide. You may remember this um, great and useful information from uh, Pete Meyer and Sandra Davis, uh, longtime uh, supporters and authors around the, uh, around the CPI instrument, and they uh, have uh, identified for us uh, what do the various managerial styles look like for the four lifestyles of the CPI. Uh, remember that John's scores came out at implementer level seven. I've highlighted his implementer uh, characteristics. You can see that implementers value accountability and goal clarity and so on, what they support, what they want, what they show. And already I'm getting some words that I could use to perhaps describe John in terms of his strengths and style. Oh, and here are some possible mistakes that he might make when, when, when mistakes occur and is ignoring creative or unusual ideas or maybe being too competitive and pushing pushing pretty hard. But 
but I go to this information, I start to write down possible words to describe John in terms of his, his uh, key characteristics. Uh, and then we'll go to the next slide and you'll see uh, the, uh, the, the third step. Uh, after I've got a sense of his, uh, he, he did not think good, his, his results suggest an implementary level seven, and now we go to the looking at the results normatively, ipsitively, and up to save time, I'm going to combine steps three and four to look at his scales in combination with one another. And if you're wondering about that first piece, the normative uh, interpretation, you look at the next slide, you'll see that uh, uh, information that was collected by CPP over, I think, about a two-year two -year period, the normative interpretation, if we can move the slide, um, you'll see the scale plot for the 20 main scales. These are 20 of the scales, anyhow, on the CPI 260. Oh, back a slide, please, Laura. Thanks. Uh, you can see the uh, scale plots for five different levels in an organization. You can see the mean um, dominance scores, DO for dominance there. Uh, and it's a pretty good-sized sample of folks in organizational life, about 6,500 people in this scale plot. If you look at that first column underneath the, uh, the, line, the line graph, you'll see that uh, the higher one goes in the organization, the higher goes the dominant score. So it perfectly maps. But the expected range seems to run from about 57 to about 65. So you kind of get a sense of, oh, okay, so we're kind of expecting scores in those mid to high 50s to mid 60s. And once you kind of have a sense of what John's scores might be relative to that range of scores, it will help you start to find and describe further strengths and possible blind spots as it runs across the whole set of 20 scales. Remember that that 50 horizontal line, that 50 that, that horizontal line there represents the average score 6,000 other people selected from the general population. That 3,000 males, 3,000 females, randomly selected. They all take the CPI 260. We score all 6,000, and then we set the average score for each scale as 50. And then when people show up in organizational life, you can see where we kind of expect your scores to show up. Notice that for the first 19 scales here, that people in organizational life running from dominance all the way through to flexibility, they score higher than people in the general population, with the exception of sensitivity, that last scale. That is, people, especially managers, executives, score lower on sensitivity. It looks like they, they run from about 42 to 47. And again, the same thing applies to what we talked about with dominance. Uh, these are expected ranges. If the scores on dominance get really high, we worry that dominance is turning into domineering uh, here for sensitivity. If, it, if the scores dip into those 30s and 20s, we start to worry <laughs> for our client about whether their sensitivity is turning into a real uh, tough-minded, insensitive, maybe not aware of their strong impact on others, uh, and in some instances, and for some people, a strong negative impact. So it's real handy, as you can imagine. Remember, the CPI is descriptive as well as comparative. So it's great to know where to find these norms and then to start to apply them to the individual's results. So if we go to the next slide, this is where we start the process. We go to page six of the client feedback report. There's John's dealing with others scores. Remember the 50, as it runs through these seven scales, represents the average score of 6,000 other people in the general population. And then we take those norms and we layer them on so you can see how John scored relative to the norms. And that's what's shown in the next slide, which I'll show you. Here's the same set of scores for John. And you can see I've gone in and just kind of marked it up with that range of scores for dominance. Remember, we expected the scores to run from about 57 to 65. So you see that first little set of red hash marks there for the dominance scale. And you think, oh, wow, that's interesting. John's dominance score is a little bit lower than I was kind of expecting, not too much lower. But a little bit lower, he scores at around 53. Huh, what do I make of that? Also, as I look over all seven scores for this uh, set of scales, I notice that they are they're kind of a little bit below the expected norms. One of them at 
Yeah, and then there's one slightly above, and then there's three or four that run a little bit lower. That's interesting. Now, these are interpersonal scales, remember, the dealing with other scales. So I'm starting to see a little bit sort of a quieter style, a little bit low-key, maybe a little bit and cautious style for John. I'm looking at that dominant score a little bit lower, and I think, huh, that's interesting. He's likely a pretty private person looking at that sociability score. That's interesting. And he's really actually not that alert to people, I think. That empathy score tells me this. I was expecting scores in the mid-60s. He's in the low 50s. He's likely not that alert to uh, at reading what other people are, maybe nonverbal cues that they're sending him about how they feel. And I'm, again, back at that dominance score. I'm looking at that a little bit lower, and I'm thinking about some, remember, I want to start a list of strengths and possible developmentals for John uh, so that I can talk about them with him. And I'm wondering about some hesitancy in asserting himself, or, or maybe it's just quiet confidence. Oh, I'll have to raise that when I, when I sit down with John and go through his results. So I'm, you see I'm starting to pull these things from this normative interpretation. Uh, off to the right on that sheet, you can see some numbers written in the margin, 1, 2, and 7. Uh, this is my attempt at an ipsative approach. That is, I'm taking a look at John's results compared to John, not compared to the norm. So I look at these seven scores and say, which one of the seven is highest? Huh, social presence. Interesting, a, a score of 58 by the looks of things. That's interesting, social presence. Well, maybe he can be witty, is what that would suggest. And he can show confidence if he has to. But it's not a, uh, it's not a usual brash sort of style that you would see with John. And again, I'm looking at, the, um, at, at combining the scores for empathy. And you can see I've written in insightfulness down at the bottom of the sheet there with a score of 52. I happen to notice that this, the uh, empathy is low. Uh, that the, the uh, insightfulness is lower, look up above, sociability is lower. Huh. He's likely not a people person. Hmm. I'll keep that in mind. Maybe he emphasizes tasks more than people. So you can kind of see I start to think in my mind of the proposals that I can make to him about his strengths and style, and maybe some developmentals from overuse or underuse of some of these characteristics. And uh, so as I kind of go through uh, this uh, normative and ipsative, and you can hear me combining the scales together, I start to come up with some, uh, some characteristics for John. And I can start to list them. You'll see them here on the next slide. Here's a, a, a list of comments that, uh, that I would start to jot down as I'm looking at his results. He can get along with others. I know he can, but, and here are some uh, conditionals, uh, maybe low key and cautious, keep some distance. It's probably hard to get to know, and he's likely kind of independent. I'll keep that one in mind. Could, could he be independent? Because there are some other CPI scales that will, that will shed a light on that. And uh, now some proposals. You know, he likely works best alone or maybe with small groups of folks that he knows well. Gee, he ought to be careful that he's not too quiet for some people, especially if he's in a supervisory or managerial role. And some people might think that he just kind of keeps information to himself. He may just think, uh, I will share the information if I think it's needed, but I'm not going to fill the space with, with unwanted dialogue. <laughs> Maybe that's what he's thinking, but uh, others may perceive it differently. But so you can kind of see, I start to assemble these uh, comments around working with people. For John, these are the things that jumped out at me from the previous seven scales and some others. If we go on to the next slide, you can see I keep on going through his protocol. Now, before I was at page six with those interpersonal scales. Now I'm at page seven with those intrapersonal scales. Um, I marked it up with the norms again. You can think, oh, interesting. Again, he's either at or below the norms for those seven scales of self-management. And I'm going to also run through it ipsitively and uh, configurally. That is, I'm going to look at uh, John's scores compared to himself, his own scores versus uh, the norms. And also, I'm going to look at scale combination. Uh, and again, you can see the numbers off to the, uh, off to the right for the self-management scales, which one was highest hmm, tolerance, which one of the seven was the lowest com commonality. Oh, interesting. Folks who score lower on commonality, again, like to separate from others. They, uh, they have that sense of uh, being 
unique from others. They want to do it their own way. They have a different way of viewing the world. Again, this is starting to fall into place with what we saw on those first seven scales. Uh, kind of individualistic, maybe, is some of the things that would jump out at, at, uh, at us. Uh, if you go down to the lower portion of that uh, page under the motivations and thinking style scale, this style scales, you can see the ACAI scales. Remember, we always look at those in combination with one another, so I can see that TAI is higher by almost two standard deviations, 19 points. Wow, that's a big difference, a significant difference in the direction of being independent, uh, kind of like, a, hey, tell me what is wanted, now go away and let me get us there, don't micromanage me, don't get in my face, and, uh, you know, that fits very nicely with that commonality comment. I'm getting a sense of John as being somebody who marches to the beat of his own drummer, or whatever that comment is, uh, and it's in keeping with some of the earlier remarks that we made from the interpersonal style scales. So if you go on to the next slide now, you'll see I'm starting to build myself a list. Here's the second cluster of proposed strengths for John with the clear objectives and expected outcomes, but wants to find his own path through. You can see where I got some of this from those scales. There's the marches to the beat of his own drummer comment. Doesn't like to be micromanaged. That's that ACAI proposal. You know, just tell me what's wanted now. Let me figure out how to get us there and I'll likely get us there in ways that are different from the way you might do it, but it'll, it'll get done. And uh, so such folks don't like to be micromanaged, and I'm making a proposal here. You know, maybe when John's in a supervisory role, maybe he extends this freedom from constraint and micromanagement to his associates. I don't like to be micromanaged. I will not do that to them, even when he ought to, if he's in a supervisory role. And so I will, in the debrief session with John, alert him to that possibility as a, a, a way that he could uh, adjust his uh, management style. But you can kind of see the uh, strength starting to build. Uh, I go on to the uh, next slide and you'll see I, I just went through the, the, uh, the uh, personal characteristics and work-related measures uh, scales, again marking them up so that I can see where I was expecting the scores to show and looking at John's scores relative to them. Uh, that first uh, scale, insightfulness, again, that's that ability to read what other people are thinking, but more at a conceptual, theoretical level, as opposed to that empathy. You can see I wrote his empathy score in, which you remember was also about 10 points or more lower than we expected. His insightfulness scores are lower. I'm starting to think, gee, he could be a better student of people. He's, he misses cues. He doesn't pay attention to them or he ignores them or he doesn't want to get involved with them. What's with that? I'm thinking to myself, especially if he's in a managerial or supervisory role. Uh, interesting, look at that LOP for the third scale in the left margin. It's our little uh, short form for lowest on profile is um, sensitivity scores. You can see them. Uh, you kind of think, gee, he can be pretty tough-minded and kind of resolute and kind of step back from people, maybe emphasizes task more so than people. So I'm starting to assemble uh, these, um, these comments for John uh, that are really coming together. Let's take a look at them on the next slide. Here's my third set of strengths for him, <clears throat> some perspectives on leading. Um, I think you know where I got these things now, independence and individualism. Uh, he likely puts his own values ahead of the mandates of the broader culture. Uh, he'll when he once he agrees he'll get behind things, but he will want to do things in his own unique way. And uh, and I'm thinking back about those dominant scores being a little bit lower, hmm, and those achievement via independent scores being higher. I'm thinking, gee, I wonder if this is a guy who uses his SME status, his subject matter expertise, in order to assert authority and, and to win people over more so than he uses interpersonal skills. So even though I'm looking at proposed strengths, and, and there are some strengths there, I'm also starting to try to set up, if I can, a conversation about uh, some adjustments that he could make on perhaps some blind spots. Uh, fourth set of strengths are on the next slide that jumped out at me, uh, again, about his openness to change. Remember that his achievement by independence was real high. Uh, his flexibility scale scores were clearly elevated. His commonality score was low, so it kind of tells me about a uniqueness and an individualistic stance. 
and his tolerance scores, if you recall, were open or were higher, suggesting an openness to people and their ideas. So I thought, gee, there I've got four instances of it. I'm going to make a comment in his list of strengths about his openness for change. He's probably uh, a change agent in his way, in his quiet way. And then we need, of course, in order to balance out these strengths, uh, some proposed uh, developmental opportunities. Uh, you can see I've got some on the next slide. Uh, I came up with two for John. And the first sort of constellation of comments all came around being attentive to people. Uh, that, would kinda, that could kind of help him remember those dealing with other scales. Remember those seven scales were all lower. His empathy and insightfulness were lower. His sensitivity was low. And, it, uh, and that's why I came up with these comments. There's that comment for the third, uh, the third point about being more a student of people. Uh, and when we get into our coaching conversation, uh, I have some ideas for him as to how he might want to start to address that. And, uh, and there's a reason for him attending to this. It might help him be even more effective beyond his subject matter expertise at, uh, at uh, showing spirit and, and persuading people to uh, get on board with his ideas. So that's a whole constellation of uh, things around the first developmental uh, possibility. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide. Um, remembering that what, so what, now what <laughs> sort of uh, model. Um, I took a look at a number of his slides. I, that slightly lower dominance score was worrying me, and hence that first comment I want to sort of propose uh, to John. Uh, in terms of um, being a little bit more uh, willing to assert and defend his ideas when he needs to, um, especially with those uh, those forceful and skeptical uh, implementers and uh, innovators that he might bump into. So we put all of those together uh, and come up with this uh, sort of depiction of uh, strengths and style for John. I think you can kind of see the iterative nature of the process. I, you know, I never get it on the first pass. I have to go through the results three, four, five times, and then things start to dawn on me as to uh, proposals that I could make to John. Hopefully, you can see from this process uh, there's an art and a science to it. Uh, the science certainly is the is the data, extensive data behind each one of the CPI scales. Uh, there's a science, I think, to the uh, sort of iterative nature of following the steps. There are descriptions of a higher and lower scores that actually come from somewhere. But there's also a, uh, an art to this. There's a, you've got to start to listen to your own hunches. Uh, gee, I'm starting to, like I did with these results. Gee, you know, I, I, I saw some skills scores. I just wanted to alert John to these things and start a conversation with him. And uh, hopefully that all came through as we went through, uh, through John's results. Now let's take a look at some uh, FAQs now. Uh, these are uh, questions that uh, have come in over the uh, transom over the months. They are also some questions that come up uh, from uh, attendees at our certification programs. The first one, how do you suggest framing a client's test-taking mindset to address the issue? Uh, and I would say, uh, first of all, is to, uh, in the certification program, you may recall that we, we spent a little bit of time um, practicing how to administer a CPI, how to set it up so that you reduce the fake goods uh, that you might get, so that you reduce people getting into self-presentation mode as opposed to self-revealing mode. And uh, what I try to do is to um, uh, spend some time with my clients explaining why we're using the CPI, what it does, why this is going to be helpful for us. And then I usually say to them at some point, just remember when you're answering the items, to be yourself, respond quickly and candidly as you think you generally are, not as you think you should be or the way other people want you to be. And I try not to get into conversations at all about you at home versus you at work because um, I, I don't want to introduce any sort of artificiality into their responses. Uh, I don't want them to start to kind of think about, about the way I want to come across at work because I think they can quickly morph into uh, self-presentation as opposed to being self-reviewing. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, number two, how changeable are the scores? Uh, they are reasonably consistent. 
you may remember some of the conversation that we had in our certification programs that it, uh, evidence would suggest that some of the interpersonal characteristics might be uh, more easily uh, adapted and changed. You can teach people to speak a bit more, maybe a bit more forcefully, maybe a, be a bit better organized in how they present, be a bit more confident in how they present. And you can also perhaps teach the opposite, <laughs> get people to speak a little bit less, uh, to not kind of try to fill every silence with a barrage of words, uh, be more active listeners, engage and ask people questions and, and, uh, and, and let other people uh, uh, speak. Uh, so those interpersonal things seem to be easier taught, easier changed. There are some characteristics on the CPI that are a bit more enduring, uh, characteristics like responsibility, uh, conscientiousness, uh, maybe even integrity and ambition and so forth. I think some of those things are, are a little bit uh, more enduring, as I say, and, and not as easily uh, changed. But um, over the, the test-retest statistics that we looked at in the certification program suggest that uh, the scale scores are reasonably robust. They, they adjust with life's challenges, but the scores generally come back. Uh, number three, question number three, how can I handle a confidentiality issue when my client's manager demands to see his results, but my client doesn't want his manager to see them? Uh, a classic question around professional and ethical use uh, of uh, an assessment like the CPI. I think this would also apply to Myers-Briggs and to lots of other assessments that you might be using in your battery. I'd say that the, my best response would be to avoid this tension in the first place uh, before it comes up by being very clear with your organization and with individuals uh, as to um, who gets to see the information why they get to see the information. Personally, I like it best if it's as in a developmental situation if the data belongs to my end client and I like to spend some time with them saying, now what are you going to do with your results? And one of the things that I might suggest to them is that they take the results and go back to their manager and kind of say, well, that was an interesting process. I heard some things. I found out some things I think that are uh, helpful to me in terms of my own strengths and style, and here they are. And to list those uh, and discuss them and kind of ask, uh, would you agree? Would you agree that this is what I bring to, uh, bring to our teams? And uh, in like spirit to say, well, and here's a developmental opportunity or a limitation or a blind spot that I picked up. And uh, I think, I'll, yeah, I think that this, uh, at some level there's some truth to that. And if I can address that, I think I could be even more effective. Would you agree and would you help me? So I like to set up that conversation uh, uh, ahead of time. Um, I try not to get myself into these kind of situations where uh, the manager demands to see the results and my client doesn't want that to happen. Uh, and I try to avoid that. And quite frankly, in most situations that are developmental, I, wouldn't, I would not get involved in that. I would not say, well, I'm going to share those results with you uh, over the objections of my, of my end client. The, the main uh, exception to that rule, of course, is in the uh, selection application for the CPI. Uh, and again, that's a situation that has been well defined ahead of time. And I've never, in all the years that I've been doing it, never had a client say, no, I don't want you to, to use the, uh, the assessment uh, as part of a selection decision. Uh, I've never had that happen. Uh, so let's see. The uh, fourth bullet asks about more FAQs. Uh, Laura, I'm wondering if anybody emailed anything in during our rambling conversation here. Yes, Rob. We got several questions. Um, one interesting one, and we may only have time for this one remaining one. Um, somebody wrote in and said, I've been asked to work with support staff to develop interpersonal skills and pre-leadership skills. The CPI doesn't seem relevant. I use the MBTI tool and am wondering if there is a secondary recommendation you might have. Well, uh, I have used the CPI in situations like that uh, for support staff and, uh, and, and for new managers uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, well, first of all, I do like to blend it in with something like the Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs is just absolutely made for a situation like that. 
Um, I think uh, you, people get a lot of very useful information out of the uh, MBTI. Uh, lots of it has to do with it, um, just the way the uh, the whole model, the Myers Briggs model, celebrates the contributions of all 16 types and very gently uh, and supportively addresses um, possible blind spots. But it really tries to celebrate strengths. I think that's why the MBTI is so powerful in that situation. Where I would use the CPI in a situation like this with uh, possible support staff would be to say, uh, if you, especially with people who have aspiration to move beyond support staff uh, into uh, supervisory positions or to work a lot and closely with supervisors, managers, and executives, is to have a sense of, uh, for them, as to how they may be similar and how they may be different from such populations. That is, uh, just looking at those, at their own results compared to those norms uh, could be a real eye-opener. But there is a caveat that goes with it, and that is you want to make sure that somebody doesn't look at their results and, and get that feeling of devastation of, oh, wow, I could, I could never uh, play at, at that level. Um, so that's why I would kind of blend the MBTI into, uh, into the mix. I hope that responds uh, adequately. I think you did, Rob, and I think you've done a great job. Um, I think we're just about out of time, unfortunately. But before we close, I'd like to remind everyone that CPP does have a Refer a Colleague program for the CPI 260 certification. If you refer somebody who does register, we'll send you a $50 Amazon gift card as a token of our gratitude. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and especially you, Rob, for sharing your awesome knowledge and expertise. You truly are an expert. Um, for those who are still with us, if you've opted out of receiving CPP email communications and want to receive the follow-up pieces that we'll be sending you, you're going to need to change your email preferences by going to www.cpp.com slash email preps. That's E-M-A-I-L-P-R-E-F-S. And we thank you all for joining us. And remember, part two on October 16th. Goodbye. Thanks, all. Best luck to you. <laughs>